Hey up everyone. To me, one of the things that makes riding a motorcycle such a visceral experience is the sound. So in this, the first in a series of videos, that is exactly what I will be looking at. Now, any list is subjective, but this one is probably more subjective than most. So if I leave out a bike you think sounds better, I'm sorry, but you are free to add it in your comments. I do always say to people, the comments can reveal a lot as well as the videos. Sorry the last couple of months I haven't been posting as many big videos as usual, but I have been away and I've had a lot of catching up to do. The t-shirts and printing have taken a back seat this year, but I need to spend some time updating the shop. There are always discount codes that come up on the Redbubble shop too, so it's worth signing up so that you find out when a discount is on. Anyway, I'm back for now. I have decided to split this into three videos, the first one for the four strokes and the second for the two strokes. Comparing them is impossible, so I decided to deal with them separately. Then there's a third video where I look at five motorcycles that just can't be compared to anything else. So today I will start with the four strokes. Trying to thin the list down has been an almost impossible task. Even doing a top 20, there are many fantastic sounding bikes that just couldn't be included. But as I often say, I have to stop somewhere. This one has been in the making for a long time and I know you appreciate the work that goes into the videos, but I know the gods at YouTube don't always reward good videos or do what they say they will. I'm sure you've noticed the not so helpful changes in the way the search results are presented, and it is getting more and more important to get the videos shared by people. So if you use any forums or groups on any social media, please share the video with them to help spread the word and try to remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy it. It really does help. So, jumping in. At number 20, we have the Honda CB354. The Honda CB354 was made for just three years, from 1972 to 1974. It was far from a great sales success. It isn't the biggest or fastest or the highest driving engine, or particularly anything out of the ordinary in many ways, but there is something about the sound that just makes me smile. One of the smallest four-cylinder production engines built at the time, it had a faster revving engine and a slightly higher pitched tone than its bigger brothers. It would happily rev past the maximum power point at 9,500 RPM, and when ridden hard, with no water jacket to dull down the sound, they just sound like an engine that is in harmony with itself. With the standard 4 inch 4 exhaust and big earbox, they ran great, but the sound was muted. Open them up with some bell mouths on the intake and a good 4 into 1 mega, and they would scare children and pets with the best. I guess this would be the time to try and explain why, to me, it's not just about how loud the pipes are, but I'd rather just let the bikes talk for themselves. So I will leave a short segment between each bike so you can enjoy the sound uninterrupted. I have included timestamps for you so you can jump between bikes if you want to. Next, we have four bikes from the late 1980s. These were four pot 250cc motorcycles built primarily for the Japanese market, but often shipped elsewhere as grey imports. They were screamers, built for a very niche market, and they are hard to separate in many ways. At number 19, we have the Suzuki GSXR 250. The Suzuki GSXR 250 arrived in 1987 and weighed just 138 kilos or 304 pounds. It produced 45 horsepower at 14,000 RPM and had a 17,000 RPM red line. At 
At number 18, we have the Honda CBR250R and the subsequent RR models. Honda also released the CBR250R in 1987. It was a little heavier than the GSX-R250 at 153 kilos or 337 pounds and it hit its 40 horsepower maximum power at 14,500 rpm. But it will keep revving up to its 19,000 rpm redline. At 17, we have the Kawasaki ZXR250 Ninja. Kawasaki gave us the ZXR250 Ninja in 1989. It weighed 141 kilos or 310 pounds and produced the same 45 horsepower as the Suzuki GSXR. But it revved high, with max power at 15,000 rpm and a 20,000 rpm redline. Ahead of these, very slightly, at number 16, I put the Yamaha RFZR250. First to hit the market in 1986, the Yamaha RFZR250 weighed just 140 kilos or 308 pounds. It produced 45 horsepower at 14,500 rpm and had a more than achievable 18,500 rpm redline. The sound was truly astounding producing over 300 detonations every second at maximum revs. Those 20 valves bounced around in that twin cam head faster than on any production bike before. Honda, Suzuki and Yamaha all released further models with more R's in the subsequent years, but it is these original four bikes that are the ones I love the most. They had a real rawness that was gradually smoothed out on the later models. Everyone tried, but no one could beat the benchmark that Yamaha had set. Suspension, brakes and steering were all improved, but the first model FZR engine was unbeatable. All these motorcycles do have a similar sound, but listen closely and you will hear that they do have different tones. The final sound will always be affected by tuning and aftermarket cans too, of course. Next, we start to get even more contentious because there is probably not one of the next 15 bikes where someone won't jump up and down shouting but that should be number one. Remember, these are all truly great sounding bikes. No one bike would be number one for everyone. At number 15, we have the Ducati 916 SP, the SP2 and SP3. I mentioned the 916 in the second of the exotic Italian motorcycles videos linked above. Here I chose this model built from 1994 to 1996 because of several reasons. Although maybe not the air called Ducati you might have expected, the 916 SP didn't pull its maximum power of over 130 horsepower until 10,500 RPM. It took over 10 years for Ducati to make a higher revving superbike engine. That was the Ducati 999R Toesland rep, built in 2005. By then, a catalytic converter and other changes had calmed the frantic noise of the engine and exhaust significantly. So although it revved higher and made more power, it didn't quite sound like it did. This whole era was driven by the Kijiva takeover and the Castiglione brothers' obsession with racing. The engine design and development was pushed forward by the Kijiva research team and overseen by the great Massimo Tamburini himself. These bikes had the low down guttural growl of the older air called Ducati's exhaust, but revved much higher. 
hearing one heading away from you or even overtaking you can actually be a pleasure. The power doesn't really come on song until around 8000 RPM. So you have about 3000 RPM range to keep between if you were to get the absolute most from the SP models. The standard models are a little more forgiving and sound almost as good. If you own one with a full Temigioni race exhaust system, you will have a definite love-hate relationship with anyone who rides behind you, that is for sure. At number 14, we have the Laverda Jota. This is another motorcycle that I know many will argue should be at the very top of the list. But wait till the end and you will understand my dilemma, I'm sure. The Laverda Jota was the fastest production motorcycle of its day. A 1000cc monster of an air-cooled triple that was created by adding a third cylinder to their highly successful 750 twin-cylinder endurance racer. The result was a brute of a bike. They were big and brash and produced over 95 horsepower at 7,800 RPM, giving it a world-beating top speed of between 130 and 135 miles an hour, depending who you believe. Initially, the engines were a 180-degree crank, but later models ran a 120-degree firing order. There were many model variants built over the years, and people with far more knowledge than me will tell you about all the minor differences between what they consider to be a true Jota and bikes like the Jarama, RGA, RGS, 3C and 3CL. When it comes to sound, there's a real difference between the 180 and 120 degree engines. The 120 degree engine has a more even sound. The 180 degree engine has more of a pulsating sound. Everyone will have their own opinion which is best. Thanks to the guys at Club Laverda for the footage. Mine is a cylinder short for this video. At number 13, we have the cross-plane Yamaha YZF 1000 R1. When the idea of the cross-plane R1 engine was first unveiled, I think it was one of those moments when many people thought, how come we never thought of that before? When we heard it, that statement changed to one of, why didn't we think of that before? It gave the R1 a sound that was so distinct it was uncomparable to any across the frame 4 that had been before it. Some people may say it sounds like a V4, but it doesn't. It has a sound all of its own. It's like saying a 270 degree parallel twin sounds like a V-twin. There may be similarities, but they just don't sound the same at all. The result, simply put, is a more uneven sound. There is a lull and a pulse within the rev cycle, which makes it sound like the illegitimate child of a short stroke in line 4 and a fast revving V-twin. There is just something unruly about the way that it sounds. Enough said, I will leave you to enjoy it for a moment. at number 12 we have the BSA Rocket 3. Yes I said BSA and not Triumph and no it wasn't a mistake. The new Triumph Rocket 3 might sound nice in some people's eyes but the original BSA Rocket 3 for me just sounds better. Maybe I'm just biased and maybe the memories of childhood dreams have left me with the auditory equivalent of rose tinted glasses. Some will say you can't mention the BSA without mentioning the Triumph Trident of old, 
and even the infamous Triumph Hurricane, but to me, there is something that always stood out about the original BSA Rocket 3. Too little and too late to save the then failing British motorcycle industry, it was still a fantastic motorcycle. With the improved understanding we now have about flow dynamics to improve cooling and fuel delivery, I wish someone would design an all new long stroke air and oil pool triple today. That is a project I would love to help with. Some of the footage here is from the legendary Rob Knoll. I hope you enjoy it. At number 11, we have another fabled motorcycle, the Britain V1000. I don't think there will be many of you who haven't at least heard of the Britain V1000, but just in case, and for the few who don't know, John Britton was a mechanical engineer from New Zealand who decided he was going to rewrite the book on motorcycle design. His motorcycle had so many innovations that you could fill an encyclopedia with a list of them. This is one of those classic examples where you realise that anyone with a dream can change the world. Who knows what could have happened without his sad loss, but that is a story for another day. This is a motorcycle that made the big V-twins of the day sound decidedly ordinary. Ducati had been chasing that low frequency boom of the airbox resonance for years and they may have got close, but the Britain still sounds better. The artwork of an exhaust system built by someone who truly understands flow dynamics is like nothing I have ever seen before and epitomises John Britton's uncompromising attention to detail and determination to be better. I will come back to John Britton in a future video, but it is a long-term project, so don't expect it soon. Counting down, we finally get to the top 10. And at number 10, we have the MV Augusta 500 3C. MV Augusta had dominated racing for years. That dominance began in 1956, and other than a sole win for Gilera in 1957, they had won every 500cc world championship since. In 1966, a new triple took over from the previous four-cylinder bike. It won every 500cc world championship from 1966 to 1972, each one in the hands of the great Giacomo Agostini. Agostini took over where the great Mike Halewood and John Surtees had left off and passed the mantle to Phil Reed at the end. So for a consecutive 17 years, MV Augusta won the 500cc world title and in total, that was 18 500cc world titles in just 19 years. The MV Augusta 503C triple sounded like nothing else. The sound was indescribable, and these were the first MV Augusta with four valve heads. With video footage, it can only ever give you an idea of the sound. Hearing the MV at Tickover, is like standing next to a prize fighter just before he enters the ring. It bristles with the threat of uncontrolled power. One question I have, which I will be totally honest and say I have failed entirely to find out for definite, is the firing order and crank design of the MV Augusta 503C. Looking at these pictures, which are the best I could find, it looks like a 120 degree crank but I will await someone who can put me right in the comments. In the meantime, just listen a moment and enjoy the beautiful sound of the MV Augusta 500 3C. At 
And number nine, we have a very different bike. The Fueling W3. For those of you that don't know, in simple terms, the Fueling W3 is like a Harley twin cam engine with an extra barrel on the front. So instead of potato, potato, you get potato, to potato, to. But that is a hopefully humorous oversimplification. What the Fueling W3 actually is, is a radial triple with the barrels offsetting 90 degrees of the full arc, so that you get a 45 degree separation of each cylinder. To illustrate this, I've included a moving diagram of a 9 cylinder radial engine, but you have to imagine it with only 3 cylinders working and the rest blanked off. Similarly, you could try and imagine a Ducati L twin engine with an extra barrel between the two existing ones. Anzani used a similar engine for motorcycles in the very early 1900s, but no one that I know of has tried since. The engine note is totally unique in the motorcycle world. Another shining light taken before his time, Jim Fueling died in 2002 and I don't think many more bikes have been built in the years since. The company still exists, but only as a tuning house for Harleys. None of the fueling bikes or engines are listed as available, although some parts still seem to be. At number 8, we have the Honda VFR 400 and the later RVF 400. This, the baby of the VFR family, is the proof that bigger isn't always better. The VFR 400 was effectively a VFR 750 in miniature. Sounding like an angry hornet looking for vengeance, the VFR 400 was a masterpiece in many ways. It was small and light with razor sharp steering and an ability to carry corner speed like no other bike of its day. On most tracks it would outperform motorcycles twice its size. Even its bigger brother would find it hard to get away from the VFR 400. It might be faster and much more powerful but what it gained on the straights the 400 would claw back again in the corners. During my years of track days, I've chased and been chased by many bikes. Few have proved as frustrating as a good rider on a VFR 400, or its later sibling, the Alvia. Lap after lap, you will pass them down the straight, only to have them dive back up the inside or ride around the outside of you on the next corner. Pass them again, and the next corner, you are in exactly the same position. Yes. On a fast track, they can run out of steam, but on a technical track or through tight, twisty roads, they are hard to beat. 60 horsepower doesn't sound a lot, and the weight wasn't the lightest at 175 kilos wet, but get it rolling and hold your speed, and they are a hoop to ride. Max power came in at around 11,500 RPM but it held that power and would rev up to and beyond its 14,500 RPM red line. The sound of those four 100cc cylinders running at maximum revs is a joy, and they have to be one of the best looking sports bikes ever built. Now, we come to the Battle of the Sixers. But first, I'd like to give a special thanks to Kaplan America. If you haven't seen their channel, there are some fantastic bikes in their museum, and they have kindly allowed me to use any footage I want. They are linked in the description. Their footage of the next three bikes together fitted perfectly. At number seven, we have the Kawasaki Z1300.
first revealed as a prototype in 1978, the Kawasaki Z1300 went into production in 1979 and was continued until 1988. This was the biggest brute of a motorcycle that any of the Japanese manufacturers had ever built. The six-cylinder water-cooled engine hits its maximum power of 120 horsepower at 8,000 RPM, and this was pushed up to 130 horsepower in the final fuel-injected models. Despite it having a much lower rev limit than the 250 Screamers, that meant there were still 200 detonations every second at maximum power. They would rev beyond that too. Tuning houses would learn to wring every last drop of power from the beautifully designed Kawasaki engine. This behemoth of a motorcycle was no lightweight. Without fuel it weighed 300 kilos or around 650 pounds and with a full tank that rose to 322 kilos or over 700 pounds. That didn't stop it from being fast though. The British engine would take it up to around 140 mile an hour or 225 kilometers an hour if you could hang on. And that was before any tuning. Hearing the Kawasaki Z1300 click through the gears as it accelerates away from you is something many of us experienced all too often back in the day. It might not sound that fast now, but brakes and handling weren't what they are with today's bikes. It took skill and real guts to push these bikes to their limit. Next, at number 6, we have the Honda CBX1000, built from 1978 to 1981. Honda had got to market a year before Kawasaki, with the six-cylinder CBX1000. It was air-cooled, had double overhead cams and four valves per cylinder. Without a doubt, it is the most famous of the sixes, and the air-cooling gave it a less refined sound in some ways than the Z1300. Max power was less at just 105 horsepower, and that power didn't come in until 9000 RPM. That meant a wide, smooth, usable rev range, and a sound often described like a Formula One car. They do sound great, but to be honest, more like half of a V12 Formula One car, really. The bike weighed in at 250 kilos or 550 pounds dry, which made it a full 50 kilos lighter than the Kawasaki. Both the CBX1000 and the Z1300 had around the same quarter mile time of just under 12 seconds, and despite the power difference, the CBX was only one or two mile an hour off the pace of the Z1300. The air-cooled engine and those extra 1,000 revs every minute gave the CBX a slight edge when it comes to sound as far as I'm concerned, but it is a marginal call. That isn't where the story begins though. This is one of those industry stories that runs on and on, and it really begins with the next bike on our list. That comes shortly, for now, just enjoy the sound of the Honda CVX 1000. At number 5, we have the Benelli 750 Say and the later 900 Say. And this is where the story I mentioned above begins. In the early 70s, the Italian motorcycle industry was suffering. The economy had tanked and the racing, which had been the lifeblood of the Italian manufacturers, was being taken over by the new Japanese two-strokes. Benelli knew they needed a bike to stun the market, and as the story goes, 
they purchased the Honda CB504 and dismantled it down to the last nut and bolt. The Benelli engineers, in their wisdom, decided to build a six-cylinder version of the CB504. The castings and styling were very Italian, but the layout is remarkably similar to the basic Honda block. So you can see how the story started. How much of it is true is now anyone's guess. To keep the engine slim, the alternator was moved behind the barrels rather than on the end of the crank, which is something Honda then used on the CBX. So this was never a one-way story. Companies steal each other's ideas all the time whenever they can get their hands on them. It was 1975 when the 750SA went into production, a full three years earlier than the CBX-1000. The Benelli had a single cam motor, like the old CB504, but despite the fact they got it to rev to over 8,500 RPM, the power just wasn't enough. It would barely produce 70 horsepower on paper, and it just didn't pull like it should have. It was 30 kilos, or about 45 pounds heavier than the old CB504, and despite the extra power, it just wouldn't go any faster. The chassis, brakes and suspension almost overshadowed the engine. Compared to the bikes of its time, it ran on rails, and I remember the brakes being described as like hitting a wall. If only they had been able to screw a bit more power out of that engine. Even after the 1978 update to a 900cc fuel injected version, they only got an extra 10 horsepower, pushing it up to 80 horsepower still 25 horsepower down on the CBX. Having said all of that, those 6 into 6 exhausts and the fantastic handling still made it an utterly glorious bike to ride, fantastic to listen to and great to look at. So it had all the hallmarks of an unashamedly Italian motorcycle. Here is where I let you sample all three bikes together. Next, and number four, we have the Honda RC149. I was going to say we have a truly unique motorcycle, and it is, but then I thought of one I had forgotten that does have similarities. I will add that one at the end as an honourable mention. 1966 was the height of the war between the two strokes and four strokes. On the track, the two strokes were winning the battle overall, but Honda was still at the top in the smaller classes. They knew they had to simply make the bike they had rev faster, and the engineers were left with no uncertainty. Failure was not an option. The motorcycle they brought to the table for the 1966 season was the Honda RC149, a five-cylinder four-stroke, 125cc motorcycle with an eight-speed gearbox. Now imagine an inline 5 125cc motor to begin with. Each cylinder has a capacity of just 25ccs, or 5 teaspoons. Add the complexity of double overhead camshafts and 4 valves per cylinder, and it was only possible with over square pistons. The ball was 35mm and it had just a 25mm stroke. This gave the engine the capability of revving up to 21,000 RPM. That means over 437 detonations every second. That is almost 50% more power cycles in the same time as the very highest revving of all of the other bikes I have mentioned so far. Just take that in for a moment. Then add the inevitable pulsing sound wave that comes from a motorcycle with five cylinders and you might start to see why I have put such a small bike so high up this list. I still remember being passed by one at Classic Track Day 
They were racing that weekend and used the Friday track day as practice time. My first reaction was, what the hell? As I was passed by a bike that looked too tiny to hold itself together. Then the question of, is that a misfire? As I passed it again. After a few more corners, I suddenly clicked and just sat behind it for a few laps to enjoy the music. I will let you do the same now. We are getting down to the real top of the list now, and at number 3 we have the Moto Guzzi 500 V8. Built in the late 50s, the Moto Guzzi V8 is an engineering masterpiece. It had the crank running across the frame and produced 78 horsepower at 12,000 rpm. Water cooling meant the inner cylinder bores were kept at a more stable temperature, and double overhead cams helped keep the valves in time. Eight tiny Del Auto carbs fed the 62cc cylinders, and using the same formula as above, that gives us 400 detonations per second at maximum power. Despite all the engineering prowess and the sheer power and speed of the bike, it was renowned as a handful to ride. Reliability was patchy too, and the riders drove a move to move to a simple design but the Italian manufacturers were pulling out of racing in preparation for an imminent economic meltdown. Even if it wasn't as successful as many would have hoped, it has gained a legendary status. The Morbidelli is the only other full production V8 I can remember, and the less said about that the better I think. Apart from the PGM that I talked about in part 2 of the Dangerous Motorcycles video linked above of course. I know the great Sammy Miller is fond of getting the Moto Guzzi V8 he has out and talking endlessly about all the engineering excellence involved in building it. There really is no other motorcycle quite like it, and I salute Moto Guzzi for creating this marvel of a machine. Now, at number 2, we have the Laverda V6. The Laverda V6 is less well known than the Moto Guzzi, and as a project he could say it was never actually finished. There was really only one prototype. It was raced, but changes in regulations and an economic meltdown in Italy killed the project and arguably led to the first downfall of the Laverda mark. I will give a special mention here to Cordis, who years after, driven by the same passion that fueled the original build, set about trying to reconstruct and rebuild a second Laverda V6. But that, as we say, is a story for another day. It was 1977 when the project was launched, and the idea was to finish the bike and race the V6 in the great Moldor endurance race at the Paul Ricard circuit in France. This monster of a shaft-drive water-cooled 90-degree V6 engine had chain-driven double overhead cams and four valves per cylinder. It was also the first design I know of where the designers began to discuss the centralisation of mass to improve the handling characteristics of the motorcycle. Liberta lured Giulio Alfieri from his work at Lamborghini and Maserati to spend one day a week at Laverda with Luciano Zen. They were to design a V6 engine for a motorcycle. The engine ran down the frame with the barrels out to the sides. The top frame rail ran between the cylinder blocks to reduce the overall height and keep mass low. It looked and sounded like a miniature Maserati engine. The six huge bell mouths pointed upwards 
like they were threatening to suck the rider into the intake manifold at any moment. The overall length was kept manageable by using the engine and gearbox as part of the chassis and mounting the swing arm pivot directly to the gearbox casing. The swing arm was initially very short, but the design had to be revised. It was lengthened and ran under the gearbox, but handling for such a big bike was good, but the torque reaction was fierce. The prototype, less than a year old, was running in the points until a failure in the drivetrain forced retirement. The engine had proved it could run at the front, and years later was still in perfect running order. The whole bike weighed just 200 kilos, or 440 pounds, which was a lot less than the air-cooled 1000cc Liberta triples. The engine would produce 140 horsepower at 11,800 RPM and was clocked with a top speed of 177 miles per hour or 285 kilometers per hour, totally smashing the limits of the day. In short, that meant it didn't produce quite as many detonations per second as the motor guzzy, but they were far bigger. After that race at Paul Ricard, an application was put into the FIM to reduce the maximum number of cylinders allowed to fall. The only motorcycle affected was the Laverda, but the controlling organisation in Italy failed to notify Laverda, so they had no chance to protest the changes. That one application and the consequent decision to implement the four-cylinder rule ruined Laverda as a small company. They would never recover, and the identity of the people who called for that new rule was never revealed. So, we finally get to number one. Although, as I said, I have realised now I have missed out a bike I featured in a previous video. I will talk about that shortly. For now, a number one on the list is the Honda RC 174 350cc 6. It was 1967, a year after the launch of the Honda RC 149 5 125 and the RC 166 6 250. To say the RC 174 was simply a bored out version of the 250 is true to a certain extent and it wasn't a 350 at all with a capacity of just 297 cc it was a 300 racing against 350s it was given to the legendary mike halewood who won in its first race at hockenheim in 1967. it then went on to win the championship that year and the following year in 1969, Honda made the decision to withdraw from racing at the height of the success of the RC174. However, its status by then had been cemented in the Motorcycle Hall of Fame alongside the rider who had made it famous. Producing around 66 horsepower at 17,000 RPM, the bike had a top speed of around 160 miles per hour, and at that speed, 450 detonations every second make it the single most explosive bike in this whole list. I haven't had the privilege of riding one of these iconic motorcycles, but I have sat behind one for many laps around Cadwell. I have heard it described as the world's loudest bike. That was a while ago, but I'm not going to argue. At first, I wondered what was happening. My sight would blur momentarily as two of them sat in front of me in the pits revving their engines. That blur was literally the liquid in my eyeballs oscillating. Every time the engine hit a certain RPM, the same thing happened. The noise was like nothing I had ever heard before or since. The six large bomb megas from each bike meant I was surrounded by a wall of sound that seemed inescapable. That day, 
I was actually on a significantly faster bike. I didn't gear. I happily sat behind them whilst I got used to the sound and hearing them rev through the gears from the old earpin right around to Park Strait was a joy. That day is one of the reasons they sit at the top of this list. Listening to them was as visceral as any auditory experience I had ever had. The sound was truly mesmerising. Now, there is one last honorary mention. I said earlier that the RC149 was a truly unique motorcycle. That was based on its five-cylinder design. Then I remembered that we did have another five-cylinder bike I mentioned previously in the second Terrifying Motorcycles video linked above. That bike is the Honda RC213V, a very different five-cylinder motorcycle but another motorcycle that should really have featured in this, the most difficult list I have ever tried to compile. First seen in 2015 and released in 2016, the RC213V was and still is the closest thing to a MotoGP bike that had ever been made legal for use on the roads. Its V5 engine will produce 215 horsepower and is rated for 217 miles per hour with the standard drivetrain. Where it should have fitted in this list is anyone's guess now, because I completely missed it, as I inevitably have others, like the ill-fated Honda NR500, which could also have been included. Let me know the bikes you think I should have included, and the bikes they would replace in the list in the comments below. I have planned a two-stroke follow-up to this, but it may take some time, so try and be patient. There are plenty of other videos on the channel to watch in the meantime. Thanks to everyone for your continued support. I hope you've enjoyed the video and can take the time to look around the channel to watch some of the others you might have missed. If you've got this far and haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Subscribing will mean, in theory, you get to find out first when our regular updates, news, views and other videos go out each and every week. But do remember to check in, as YouTube doesn't always do what it's asked to. I have had a fair few people now say that they didn't get a notification about new videos. Please share the video with anyone you think will be interested too if you could. It all helps get the channel out there to new potential viewers and kicks the YouTube algorithm into gear. It's coming up to the present time too, so don't forget, we do the best t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and so much more it's hard to list it all without it getting overwhelming. You can visit the website or the Redbubble shop linked in the description below, or drop me a message via the contact page on the Burbones MC website if you can't find what you want. There are more exciting MedCycle adventures and other stories from the shed and beyond on the website too, so why not grab a cuppa and take a look around. You won't be disappointed. Thanks for watching. I hope you get some great riding in. Ride free everyone.